Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 6th of July, 2017, and we have a question and answer session. First question is from Cornell Flint. How do you deal with a, slightly, a slight delay whilst recording on two separate audio recorders? I have a Zoom H1 and H5 whilst recording files longer than 15 minutes. When synced on the beginning, on the end, you can tell that they're getting out of sync. Echo effect. Don't know how to tell us to describe that. I know you should only use one recorder, but in some cases, weddings, I have to use a couple different ones to place them on individuals. I anticipate this might be a bit of an odd question. Thanks for considering anyway. Kind regards. So uh, I don't know if you say Cornell or Cornell. Cornell, I apologize in advance uh, for slaughtering your name. Um, I, I, no, I don't think that's unusual at all to use, a mul to use multiple recorders. You, you know, you do what you have to do to get the sound. Um, there are a couple of things that I would suggest. Number one, um, you may have to do some railroading in post. That is to say, you don't want to leave the open mic, um, the mic of the person who is not speaking, in the final mix. Um, you'd really just want to have, or you know, you want to fade it back when that person's not talking. So you don't, then you'll, that'll stay away. That'll help you avoid that echo issue in the first place. That's a, you still have a sync issue to deal with and we'll come to that in just a second. But that's the first thing. And let me just um, give you an example here. We're going to pull up Audition. This was uh, a short film. I think I've, yeah, I know I've shown this before, but um, this only has one dialogue track, but nevertheless, I think I can illustrate it with this. So here we have some dialogue and then we actually, let's just assume this was dialogue of a second person. Technically it's not, but if it were. But this is how I would lay it out. So I would go into the multi-track view, and you can do this in Premiere as well, or Final Cut, or you know, however you're doing it. But um, I, this is called railroading it here, so where you kind of lay it down on different tracks. Um, so when this person's not talking, we didn't leave that audio there. Instead, we replaced it with the person who is talking, and... If there wasn't already some good room tone in both recordings, so it doesn't sound jarring cutting back and forth between them, you'd also want some room tone on another track below that to kind of help create that continuity. So that's one thing. Um, in addition to that, you have the sync issue. What you may have to do is you may have to cut and nudge. And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, you, if you look at your footage and the audio recordings with it, um, I don't know, it's not clear to me whether both of them are out of sync or just one of them is out of sync from the other. Um, if I had to guess, the H5 is probably still in sync and the H1 is out of sync, but I'm, you know, only you know that. <laughs> um, but what you may need to do is cut maybe after five minutes for the one that's out of sync, and you may need to nudge it over a frame or two or whatever. Um, and then you fill that gap with tone, with room tone. Um, so that's why it's really, really important that when you're in those circumstances, you're going to want to record some room tone as well so that you can patch that in those gaps that you have to create to keep everything in sync. I hope that makes sense. Um, by nudging it, by what I mean is you actually technically you'd grab this and you can actually, um, I think there is a nudge, this particular one, this is an audition. Um, there is a way to nudge it, as I recall. And I'm not going to waste everyone's time here looking for it, but there is a way to do that. So, oh, here it is, nudge left and right. So you can use your nudge left and right commands here to kind of just push it a tiny, tiny bit to the right or left to get everything back in sync. So good question. That is a good practical issue that most of us run up against at some point. So thanks for that question. Next question up is from Steve Hoffer. Hey, Curtis, I have a Rode Procaster that works well for voiceovers. I use a Rode VideoMic Pro for on-camera work and sometimes use an iPhone for recording talent. What is the best way to blend these different sources? When should you use each type of mic? Well, um, I uh, blending them. I again, I'd be careful about blending them. Again, when you're when you're doing a mix, and we haven't talked a whole lot about mixing, just a little bit. And I'm I'm hoping to put together a course on that at some point. Um, unfortunately, it won't be the one that comes out <laughs> this summer. I'm going to focus on getting the most out of your audio recorders. That's the next set of course coming courses coming out. Um, but um, for mixing, um, it depends on the situation. So for example, if you have a piece where you're, you have an interview and you also want some sort of ambient sound, um, you may use a couple of those mics. Um, what I would be careful about though, that's, that's getting into sound design. So what you're doing in that case is you actually would be recording the amb ambience when you're not recording the interview. Um, because you don't want the voice in the ambience track. You want to be able to control that independently if you can. So I would say that the Procaster is great for voiceovers, yeah, and I would use it for that. Um, the VideoMic Pro for on-camera work, 
Um, I can also put a link to a video where I show how to boom that. I don't know if that if of interest to you, but that can make for very good dialogue audio when you're actually recording a piece where you don't want the microphone in the frame. Um, just getting it up nice and close, booming it from right above does a really nice job with that, with the Rode Video Mic Pro in particular. Um, and then iPhone is, is fine as well for recording talent, it sounds like. So that sounds like your, your close source mic. So you've got that, I assume, up close. Or you've got a little lavalier microphone hooked into the phone, however you're doing it. Um, those are all good. I would say that typically you're not going to want to blend them. You're not going to re want to record the same thing with two of them and blend them in the mix. You're going to choose one instead of the other um, is usually how I do it. And that's how you're generally going to get the best sound. Um, I think a lot of us, and certainly I assumed this when I was getting started, that blending mics, um, you know, recording with more mics and then blending them in post or in the mix makes it sound richer generally it creates more problems than it solves. <laughs> so I would go with fewer mics. The fewer you can have in the final mix, the better at any given time. Um, you really just want to mic the, you know, the person that you're trying to highlight to the audience and tell the story with. So um, there are some thoughts there. Um, the same with the, the wedding question earlier as well. You may have mics on multiple people. And I know this sounds like a lot of work. And in fact, it is, it can be quite a bit of work. But doing that railroading thing like we showed in Audition here earlier, um, you get much cleaner sound. So um, the, if you have, if you were to leave, for example, this entire gap here where this person one was not speaking, you're going to get, uh, you're getting more noise overall in your recording. And instead, what you want to do is kind of, again, focus the audience's attention on the person who's talking and who's telling the story and moving the story forward. So those are some thoughts on that. Um, so, Steve, I hope that was helpful for you. I think you can use all of them, but my, my general approach is um, when I'm recording, I may have two mics on a person, a lav and a boom, but in the end, when I'm doing my final edit, I'm going to choose one or the other. I'm not going to keep both of them. Um, I will record an, ambi an ambience track at a different time when I'm not doing the interview so I can blend that back in. I'll record room tone at a separate time so I can blend that back in and fill in any patches or gaps where I have to cut. Um, so that'll help it feel continuous. And uh, those are some thoughts on that. So I hope that's helpful. Thanks for the question. Next question up is from Gilbert K. Hello, Curtis. Thanks for your response back. I enjoy a lot of your, your tutorials. Thanks for the information. I'm an independent filmmaker, and I recently bought a Zoom F4 recorder, Control NTG4 Plus shotgun, and two Rode Link wireless mics. I appreciate if you'd be able to answer the following questions. Number one, what's the best setup to hook up two Rode Link wireless and a shotgun on an F4 recorder. There are only two XLRs, and I heard that the XLR converter for the Rode Link wireless are not good. Also, what kind of cables I need to make this work? Well, um, and I'm going to go ahead and answer this other question at the same time because it's related. On what channels do you recommend to have the two wireless and the one shotgun hooked up to? So, first, first, um, the kind of traditional way to do this and the way most editors are expecting to see it, and it's probably a good idea to get into the habit of doing this, is... Almost always the shotgun will go on channel one and the wireless will go on the following channel. So in this case, two and three. That just makes it easier for most post people, either the editor or the sound post people. That's just traditionally how it's done. And what happens is when you get the full wave file, the poly file from the Zoom F4, what you'll have is actually a mix left and right will be first, then you'll have the shotgun mic, and then you'll have the two wireless mic after that. So that's generally what, again, the post people are expecting. Even if you are doing the post, it's probably good to go ahead and get in the habit of doing that. So if you ever do find yourself in a situation where you're doing sound for another production and you need to hand it off, um, they won't be surprised in calling you up and asking all sorts of questions like, what the heck did you do here? Where, <laughs> Where's the boom? Where's the love? So on and so forth. All right. Um, so... Back to the first question. Um, so that means for your shotgun mic, you're probably going to need an XLR cable, uh, an XLR microphone cable. That's a three pin XLR mic cable. It's pretty standard. There are lots of them out there. We can put a link to one down below. Um, then from there, the Rode Link actually have a 3.5 millimeter output. You have two of them, so you have to convert them to XLR to get them into the Zoom H4, um, at least if you want to have both of them hooked up at the same time because there is only, I think there's only one 3.5 millimeter input and I've actually never used it on my F4, but I do have road links. I do use the VXLR adapter and let me just show you. 
uh, where we are here. Here it is. The Rode VXLR adapter it is about $10 US. Um, I have not heard that they're bad. I use them and they work fine. I've not had any problems with them. So I don't know um, who told you they were bad or what the problem is that they, that person experienced, but I have no hesitations recommending that you use those. They work just fine. And I've used them lots of times. So um, that's my opinion. I don't know if the other person has some experiences that suggest that they really are awful. Um, love to hear what those are, but I haven't experienced any issues. So that's what I would do. Get a couple of those uh, Rode VXLRs and those will get your Rode links converted so that you can bring them into the F4 without a problem. Question number three, also, do I record all three devices on mono or stereo for better quality sound? Um, those are two different questions, really. Well, well, mono versus stereo has nothing to do with sound quality from my point of view. They're two separate dimensions. Um, so it doesn't matter. They're mo they're, all of the mics you've talked about here are mono mics, so I would just record them each in mono. There's no reason to do anything different unless I'm misunderstanding your question. Um, I think a lot of people kind of get that mixed up that mono versus stereo is just has to do with, um, you know, a single sound source versus uh, being able to create a sound stage um, in stereo. It has nothing to do with quality necessarily from my point of view. Some people may disagree with me on that and say that stereo is always better. I, I don't see it that way. I think stereo is different. Um, but if you're recording dialogue um, and you're recording with mono mics, I don't see any reason not to, to record each of them mono. Okay, next question. Number four, should I bother recording 192 kilohertz or is it overkill? Well, for dialogue, I almost always record in 48 kilohertz um, because that's generally what you are going to deliver. Um, however, I think there are cases where re uh, recording in 192 kilohertz is actually worthwhile. And let me see if I can find you one of those spots here. I think we're coming up on it right here. Yeah, so here is a case where doing 192 kilohertz may be helpful. Let me show you what I mean. I was 11 and we all came down with the mumps. You see how, um, so we have some dialogue there, but we also have this slow motion shot of a chisel chiseling wood. Um, if you're going to have to slow down some footage and perhaps do a fair bit of processing on it, that's when I think 192 kilohertz may actually make sense. So for dialogue, I'd stick with 48 kilohertz. If you're going to be doing some sort of effect with, and you're going to be doing some heavy processing on it, then it makes sense to go up to 140 or 192 kilohertz, particularly if you're going to be slowing it down. So Gilbert, good questions. Thanks for asking those. And I hope those are helpful to you. Next up from Mike, Curtis, I recently set up my a studio in my house for an online training I'm making. I'm completely new to filming. I have the Rode NT2. Let's see, Rode NT2, if I'm not mistaken, that is this large diaphragm condenser mic. So yeah, it's a great voiceover mic. Um, let's get back to our question here. Going into a Tascam DR60D Mark II, I am familiar with that recorder. <laughs> And I'm trying to adhere to all the recommendations from your training. Once, one thing I've noticed in the raw audio is that I can hear every time I swallow or smack my lips, especially when I'm pausing for some reason as part of the script. Is this something normal that can be removed in post? Should I change something about my setup or should I strive to do cuts where I don't make any of these noises? I think the answer is probably some of each of those and let me explain. Number one, lip smacks are almost always things that you're going to uh, run into one way or the other. Even the best actors do that from time to time. There are some tricks, evidently. Um, I guess a lot of people say, and actually there's the mouth noises too. Mouth noises are kind of the dry mouth um, sound, or if you can hear the, you know, it's, it's different than a lip smack. Lip smack's one thing, but the dry mouth is where you actually hear those, like the saliva moving around in your mouth, and it's not usually a great sound. And I have some of those in my recordings from time to time. Um, there's some physical things you can do, evidently, to help those. Number one, some people suggest uh, not drinking a lot of coffee, first of all, before you do the performance. Obviously, taking some water from time to time. Hmm. Except not too quickly. Um, and then also eating uh, a bite of green apple, tart apple, excuse me, can also help with that, too. Um, so that's one thing. Number two, um, a lot of times if you're too close up on the mic, you will get more of that. So if you're hearing swallowing and stuff like that, you're probably, you might be a little too close to the mic. You might try backing off just a little bit. Um, here I'm probably 15 centimeters, maybe uh, six or eight inches, something like that. And I find that's generally a pretty good distance for most microphones. I don't know if you're working up closer than that, but I have found that when I work closer than that, 
Um, that's when you'll start to hear the mouth noises and all the other undesirable noises that you don't really want. So those are some things to consider as well. Then lip smacks, those are going to happen in our post-processing course. We talk about some ways to, to reduce those. Essentially what you're doing is you're attenuating them. Um, there are some... There is a... In uh, Audition, there is a, a an effect. There's this click remover that can be helpful. So that's one thing you might consider. I know in Adobe... Or sorry, in Isotope RX, there's a very, very good one that almost never misses. That click remover is kind of hit or miss. It'll, it works about, I don't know, 50 to 75% of the time. Otherwise, you have to go in and actually find the lip smack, highlight it, and actually get in really close and attenuate that individual thing. So that's, that can be a lot of work. But if you're going for that, you know, the most pristine audio quality, it might be worth it for your particular case. Um, and so those are, some, those are some thoughts there. Then, yeah, cutting, cutting around the noises is also a valid, uh, I think, legitimate approach to addressing those as well. But again, I would try those other things first. Back up from the mic just a touch. You, you, know, you have to be careful. There's a sweet spot because if you get too far back, then you're going to start to pick up more of the room tone. Not room tone, but the resonance of the room, if there is any of that, or reverb, ver reverberation, excuse me. Um, so you have to kind of find the sweet spot and do some experimenting with that. But that's a great question. That's something that I think most of us uh, find is a challenge at some point. So hopefully that helps a little bit, Mike. All right. Next question is from Rebecca Chadwell. Hi, Curtis. Finished watching your tentacle sound devices, 633, etc. vids, and appreciate the good information and presentation. The end goal for our studio is multi-camera recording uh, to TriCaster. So you're listing out a bunch of gear here. Recommended, uh, re sorry, recording external sound with the mixer and using hardware or an app like Pluralize to minimize post editing time. My question is general. We're using a clapper for sync reference, recording from multi wireless Sennheiser mics to a mixer that are then run through Ableton into a TriCaster, which for those that aren't familiar with um, a TriCaster, TriCaster is a um, it does a lot more than this, but it's a video switcher. So for a lot of productions where you have lots of different cameras, the TriCaster is what you use to do the switching between cameras. Um, and then you do an ex you export a reference video from the TriCaster, which was limited to two inputs from the mixer out. So that's reference sound. And then, <laughs> sorry, sorry if you aren't following here. Uh, then you import the reference vid from the TriCaster into Ableton to for cutting and dialogue mixing with external sound files, and then into Premiere using VSTs like Isotope RX to polish the final sound. Does that sound like we're on the right path? Do you have any suggestions for efficiency? We just purchased a 633 and I'm struggling to understand how that can improve our setup other than portability. Well, these are a lot of questions and, um, and it's a it sounds like a really interesting project, but I don't feel like I have enough information to really uh, necessarily improve that workflow i obviously it must be working because you're if you're if you're working with a studio and you're producing content um you're getting things out the door so that's a good start um what i don't understand for example is the when you do certain pieces can change depending on how long a piece you're use, you're shooting um so it sounds like on the tricaster it's pretty much a one take shot if you're using a tricaster most likely i don't know if you're editing down from there um that's not really clear to me because it sounds like um, cutting the video may already be done, and that's what you're using the TriCaster for while you're recording. Um, but I'm not really clear on that because when you do the audio processing, it depends a lot on the overall post workflow. So if you have, if you're sending uh, a video off to an editor to go do the the, the initial video cut. Um, if it's a longer piece, obviously, it usually makes sense for the editor to do their work first and then hand it off to the audio people to do their post work. Um, but it doesn't sound like that's necessarily what you're doing here. So I guess we need a little more information. If you wouldn't mind, Rebecca, sending it just a little bit more, like uh, tell us about, you don't have to give us all the details, especially if your studio doesn't want to share what you're producing necessarily, but maybe just a little information on when the video editing takes place, if there is any, or if it's done live with the TriCaster. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I think the, the process sounds okay. It sounds a little complicated. I'm not sure that a 633 is going to change that process aside from perhaps improving the audio quality. If you weren't happy with the audio quality coming out of your mixer, which I assume is a more traditional kind of uh, desk mixer of some sort with linear faders. Um, but yeah, it's portable. Um, <laughs> 
So I, I, I guess I don't know how enough beyond that, but I, it sounds like you have a, a workflow that's working and there are potentially some ways you could improve that. Ableton is, a, is an interesting choice for a digital audio workstation. Um, I assume you're talking about live? Um, Ableton is not usually the first choice for video and film post. Um, I haven't heard of a lot of other people using it. And the reason I say that, and maybe I'm talking about the wrong product, but my rec- my experience with Ableton years and years ago was that it was more of a uh, like a music looping kind of tool. Um, but maybe it has some other features now that it didn't used to have back then. So anyway, um, thanks for the question, Rebecca. Sorry, I couldn't help more. But yeah, if you do have more information, you want to if you want to dive in a little bit more to details, would love to talk about it some more. Next question is from Andrew Little. Hi, Curtis, I put together an online course and are re-editing and redoing a few portions of it. I have a small issue. There's a noticeable difference in the audio volume from section to section. In terms of workflow, is there an efficient way to take a bunch of video files, about 21 files, and normalize the volume across them as some sort of batch job? I have the Adobe Creative Suite. I've seen you do it on individual files, but I'm not sure about doing this efficiently. Well, let's, uh, in, in audition, what you can do very simply, if you don't have this panel down here called Match Loudness, you just come up to Window and select Match Loudness. That'll appear here. You literally just drag all the WAV files down here into this, and you can normalize them to any sort of loudness target you need to. So first of all, you need to figure out what the loudness is on the files that you've already edited. You can do that by bringing them into Audition and uh, coming up to Window and choosing Amplitude Statistics. Highlighting those the uh, you know the files that are already edited and then are at the loudness you want the others to be at. Just go ahead and scan that. It'll give you the loudness here. We're at minus 36.5. And then what you'd want to do is come back over, drag all those files down into here, and loudness normalize all those to the same loudness. So um, that's the general idea. And that's how you do it in Adobe Audition. I don't know of a way to do that as well. I mean, in Premiere, um, if you're doing your edit there, there is the um, there is the loudness um, export option. So as you're exporting, and if you I could put a link to my previous video on that, um, how you do that. But essentially, that just does the entire program. So I don't know if it would actually take the clips that are much quieter and bring those up to the same level, or it would do it to the entire thing in unison. So I think audition is really going to have to be your answer. What's the best way to do it? Actually, from Premiere, you could just round trip it from Premiere. Just select all the clips you want to bring over, right click, you know, send them to Adobe Audition, and then do your business here. And then it'll bring them right back into Premiere. So that's probably the quickest way to do it. I hope that makes sense. And uh, thanks for that. That is a, a, a good practical question as well. All right, next up, we have Marshall Harrington asking, hey, Curtis, thanks for the review of the Sound Devices Mix Pre Recorders. Got a question about how you would go about sending sound to two or more cameras in a multicam shoot with one of these. Okay, um, I've actually, I, this is a good question, Marshall. I had some thoughts about this. The first thing that I have is a, a response question, I guess. When I'm doing multicam shooting, I'm and even if I'm sending audio to the camera, I'm only sending it to one camera. And then I'm collecting reference audio on the other cameras. And then I use those to sync them all up. Then when I'm either in Premiere, or Final Cut, or um, Resolve, whatever you're editing in, or Media, um, Avid, um, whatever it is, then I actually just keep it, when I do the switching back and forth between cameras, there's an option to keep the audio from the one camera to which you recorded the good production audio. So you don't have to send the audio to all of the cameras necessarily, unless there's something very particular about your multicam setup that requires that, that's how I do it. And you still get all the great audio from the one camera that has the good audio, and you essentially just use the audio from the other cameras to get the um, multicam sequence synced up, and then from that point on, you ignore the audio from those other two cameras. So um, that's how I would approach it, but I, again, I'm not sure if there's something about your workflow that requires audio to all three of the cameras. So um, in any case, um, if there is, let me know and we can talk about it more. But I, I think it's, you, you know, your, your final question, is it possible to split the signal out of the Mix Pre 6 and have any hope for clean audio by sending it to all three cameras? Well, again, I don't think that's necessary. I think just getting it to one camera is really all you need to save all that time in post. If for some reason that I can't foresee here, you do have to get it to all three cameras. 
um, yeah, try some splitters and see what happens. I, I, I've never used that workflow, so I don't know what to expect. Um, but yeah, you could probably use splitters and it would probably be okay. I would think <laughs> if you're going to do long cable runs, remember that's an unbalanced connection. That's an unbalanced output. So, um, yeah, there's a possibility of picking up some interference along the way if you are going to do it that way. So, um, may, maybe it's not the best way, but again, if you can get it to one camera, that's good enough. I'll just make sure the other two cameras are capturing reference audio with their either inbuilt microphones. So you'll want to set the, the, you know, the input level on those microphones, or if even if you put a camera top shotgun microphone or something like that on top of each one of the other cameras, that can do a ni nice job as well. And again, then all that audio is for is for syncing up to the main camera that has the good audio. All right, um, that's all the questions we had for this week. I'd like to say thanks to everyone for submitting your questions. I hope uh, that you're having a great time making some really good recordings out there. Thanks for watching this episode, and we'll be back with you again next week. Take care, everybody.